Well, I am so happy to be here with you. Thank you for sitting down to take a little bit of time with me to share some of your wisdom. This is Dr. Wayne Jonas. Um, he is the executive director of the Samueli Integrative Health Programs and also a family physician for the past 40 odd years. So I am very excited to hear all that you've learned um, in the integrative health space since then. Well, thank you very much. And your advocacy and whole person health is such an inspiration. I'm really happy to be here and contribute to it. Oh, thank you so much. I do what I can. I'm just trying to do a little bit more of what you've been doing for a long time. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask you, because I've yet to interview somebody that has so much experience with the US military, which I'm from a military family, um, and it's always been something very interesting to me ever since I saw the documentary Escape Fire, yeah. what's really going on with the you know integrative health programs within the US military, and also as they've seen the opioid crisis develop further, how are these things being you know utilized as far as pain management and certainly all of this PTSD as more and more troops are coming back from various tours. Yeah. So you'll have to tell me, how did your 24 years in the US military influence your experience to you know, get into integrative mm -hmm. medicine or make it part of your you know, life's mission? Right. Well, that's a great question. And most people think it's strange that holistic care and the military would go together. They often don't see that there's a connection in that. But my experience in the military is that it was a great opportunity to truly take care of the whole person uh, because they're interested in you know, their mission and keeping people healthy and prevention. Uh, also, they don't have to worry about health insurance and whether they can cover it, they are covered. And so I found as a practicing physician, it really allowed me to focus on the patient pay attention to what they needed uh, and to really broaden the lens to everything that they needed, mind, body, and spirit. And the military was very open to that, so it allowed me to do that. So it was a wonderful environment, uh, uh, I think, ironically, uh, to do that. I got in because my father had been in the military, my grandfather and great-grandfather had been in the military. Oh I was almost destined to that, but I hadn't intended to stay in. Uh, but what I experienced there the, uh, and learned about integrative practices, um, you know, when I was practicing in Germany about health promotion, when I worked for the Army Surgeon General, uh, when I uh, realized they were doing research in many of these things like acupuncture and mind-body practices and electromagnetic devices, non-drug approaches, uh, I realized it was a very rich environment. So I stayed in it for the, for the whole 24 years. Mm -hmm. You'll have to tell me because I, I'm not up to date on this, but I do know that they're developing various programs in the military now to use non-pharmaceutical, non-surgical approaches for treating things like chronic pain and PTSD. At the same time, I think there's still a lot of prescribing going on and still a lot of mm -hmm. um, active duty and, and, and veterans that are addicted and things like that yeah. and having, having trouble with that. So will you just give me a, a brief synopsis of sort of where the programs are right now as far as integrative medicine and what's being utilized? Yes, well, you know, when the, these long wars that we're still in uh, started and many people started coming back with post-traumatic stress disorders, traumatic brain injury, chronic pain issues, it became rapidly evident that simply throwing pills and procedures at this was not going to solve the problem. These were much more complex issues and they needed a more holistic view. So not only did the military get involved in looking at these areas, but the Veterans Administration now is getting involved in those because many of those folks are coming out of the military and a lot of them get their care in the Veterans Administration. And so we cultivated and did research in those environments to look at whether things like acupuncture were useful for pain, uh, mind-body practices and yoga for uh, pain, PTSD, uh, trauma, even brain injuries. Uh, and when the evidence was there, they picked them up. They said, we, you know, if it works, we want it. And so uh, now they're both adopting many of these programs. Uh, there's a major program within the VA called Whole Health right now, which is a transformative way of empowering patients to be engaged in not only non-drug approaches uh, to health and healing, but also self-care, which is key. Self-care is such an important part if we're going to turn the tide of chronic diseases, if we're going to lower costs, and if we're going to improve outcomes. Uh, behavior, lifestyle, nutrition, exercise, stress management, sleep 
are all keys to the management of, and even the reversal in some cases of chronic illnesses. And so the VA sees veterans with all of these conditions and they realize they need it. And so they're beginning to actually insert these things and make them routine and regular in their healthcare delivery. Now, I wasn't trained that way. Okay, and so the skills, the abilities, the capacity, uh, the coverage components of those are not there. So it really is turning a battleship in many ways uh, from a sick care system, which can save your life. No question you don't, uh, you want it, uh, you know, when you have an infection or a trauma or you know, cancer or something like that. But we've got to go beyond that if we're going to address chronic illness. I talk about that a lot. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I, I want people to know I'm not anti, you know, I, I absolutely want the conventional healthcare system if I'm hit by a car or right. get some sort of a deadly infection traveling abroad, but I've seen the numbers and the statistics around its ability to really heal chronic illness. And right. um, yeah, it's just not quite the right approach, but it took about, you know, over a hundred years for us to figure <laughs> that out. And now we know. Well, we were so enamored by the great stuff that came out around saving your life, right? The acute care type of thing and the infectious and the trauma management. I mean, Un unbelievable miracles occurred from that system. But then when we tried to push that into more complex chronic illnesses like obesity, diabetes, depression, et cetera, it doesn't work very well. Right. So we now need to shift the model and expand beyond that. I read your book, um, How Healing Works, and loved it. Um, I was yeah. planning to ask you a lot more questions about your work in the military and just kept reading the book and wanted to ask you questions about that. So you tell a lot of great stories of health recovery through integrative medicine. And that's a large part of what I do at WellBe. Interview experts like yourself that sort of sit between this wellness movement and the conventional healthcare system. Um, but I also tell these stories of health recovery because they're just so inspiring to me and um, to my audience. And so you kind of talk about them and then explain a lot about the placebo effect. And yeah. so if you wouldn't mind summarizing what the placebo effect mm -hmm. really means from a medical and scientific perspective. Right. Well, what I wanted to try to do in the book was impart the learnings I've had over the last 40 years, having not only practiced more holistic and integrative approaches, but actually done research on those areas. Uh, I ran an office at the National Institutes of Health that did research on these areas a World Health Organization Center that did research on traditional medical practices. So I had the great opportunity to see a wide variety of types of healthcare practices with very different approaches and very different uh, modalities. Uh, and yet they all were claiming they were getting benefit. And I, I was thinking, well, how could that be? I mean, some are science-based, some aren't science-based, et cetera. And so as I began to look deeper into it and look into the science of it, I realized that what they were all doing is that they were optimizing belief ritual, conditioning, and various mechanisms that before had been sort of covered up with the term placebo effect. They were all relegated to the placebo effect. If you couldn't show a molecule worked beyond the placebo effect, it wasn't real. And yet that's where, you know, 60, 70, sometimes 80% of the healing was coming from in these systems. And so we began to do a deep dive into, well, what is the placebo effect and how does it work? And uh, maybe it's not placebo after all. Maybe it's actually the very core of what most of these systems use to induce healing, including our conventional system. Uh, and that, I think, largely is the case. Uh, I don't call it the placebo effect anymore. I call it the meaning response. It's inducing a healing response uh, by arranging the context and the meaning of care in a way that taps into our own inherent healing capacity. And by tapping into that inherent healing capacity, we get tremendous benefit regardless of what the actual modality is that we're using, whether it's a drug or a pill or an herb or a needle or a knife. And so the placebo effect is the sleeping elephant in healthcare. When we wake up to it and begin to use it rather than discard it, uh, it is going to so uh, enhance our ability to address chronic illness uh, in healthcare. I'm so excited for that to happen. I'm obsessed with research. I think like you mm -hmm. are, I love seeing proof. I think that's why I tell a lot of these stories. Um, and I cover a lot of research for my audience too. Um, but I know that from my own experiences solving chronic Lyme when I had it and a couple of other amenorrhea, a few other things, I couldn't pinpoint exactly which therapy or thing it was that did really the healing because I was doing several things at once. Yes. And it's very hard to isolate a lot of natural yeah. therapies, especially 
when you're doing, you know, a specific diet and you might also be taking certain supplements or I, in my case, I was taking Chinese herbs as well. And then I was actually doing for my Lyme mm -hmm. um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, right. which you talk mm -hmm. about in the book. Right. Um, but, you know, they were all together. So I did put my Lyme into remission, which was exciting because a lot of people have chronic Lyme for decades. Yeah. People ask me, what'd you do? I want to do it. Right. I tell them, but I say, remember, I was doing these things all together. All together. So yeah. to isolate and just pick one, it may not work for you. And also the body responds very differently to different therapies. So it may not work for you at all to do these things. And like you said, if they don't attach the meaning to certain therapies that they were doing or have the ritual around it, Right. another reason it might not work for them. Right. So can you explain how could you really do research around these different natural therapies, especially when they need to be done yeah. in conjunction? It's a great question. What we uh, now tend to do in science is we tend to divide things into parts and we do isolated studies using things like randomized controlled trials where one part gets the treatment that we think is effective and one part doesn't get it. And then that allows you to actually disentangle these different parts. But then you have to have groups that are willing to only do that and not do anything else. And sometimes that's hard to do in lifestyle, diet, for example, stress management, it's hard to do that in those areas. In addition, uh, it's not necessarily telling you exactly what you should do because those are based on averages. The results you get out of that are probabilities. Uh, and so on average, you know, 30% you know, got better with this and 40% got better with that. But that doesn't mean that's going to apply to you when you come into the office. And so we need to use that kind of research. We need to do that to try to identify, you know, how much different specific treatments are having an impact. Uh, but more importantly, we need to be able to look at the whole person, the whole system. And there's a new type of research that's emerged in the last uh, decade called systems, whole systems research. And I write a chapter uh, on that. And increasingly, mainstream community is doing that kind of research. Sometimes it's called complexity research, okay? Uh, and what it does is it actually tracks multiple inputs and multiple outcomes in large groups, and then it's able to actually separate out those kinds of influences and those kinds of effects. You can't prove this worked, but if those kinds of things are safe and they're fairly easy to do, then we know they have an influence and then they can be put into the whole system. And that's key, safe and easy to do, okay? Uh, they can't be producing negative effects for that. You know, you gotta be careful and you gotta do those kinds of randomized control trials. But many of the things in integrative health are self-care that are safe. You know, we know mind-body effects, we know exercise is important, we know appropriate nutrition is important, we know what it should be right. in those areas. Uh, and those are things that should be recommended for everyone because they're gonna raise the level of your health. And in many cases, they're gonna help you recover. Uh, diabetes and obesity are basically lifestyle-based programs. You can cure those diseases if we had a system that properly delivered them. You can prevent those. Um, and some of those have been tested in randomized control trials, but a lot of that comes from this kind of complexity observational analysis research. So there are ways to use good science to have evidence to inform you about holistic practices. That's great. I loved, you talked about in your book also the um, Ayurvedic hospital and how many different things they were doing for that patient at the same time. Yeah. And I was thinking, gosh, how did you ever study that? Like you said, it, it's challenging to separate these things out when they're being done. Yeah altogether, but it sounds like there's a system for that now. Well, you know, it is complex when you're trying to measure every little thing, but fundamentally, it's also very simple. Human beings are made up of, you know, just core fundamental things. All human beings are. Um, you know, there's certain things that we need. You know, we need, uh, you know, importance. We need food. We need safety. Uh, we need oxygen. We need to move. We need appropriate stress and stress environments where we feel relaxed and comfortable. Uh, we need to have our social and emotional needs addressed. So we need to make sure we're part of a social support system. Key. Um, we also have to address our mental and spiritual components. We need to have something we're doing that we feel is important, it has to be meaningful for us. And whether it's our family or our work or, or giving back to the community, that drives people forward. Those are fundamental parts of every human being anywhere in the world. And so if you wanna enhance health and well-being, you have to ask the questions and try to make sure those things are available to people. And it's amazing uh, how, healing actually happens when you do that. 
Um, you, that, you get them on their healing journey and they actually heal. <laughs> I was just about to ask you that because I thought that was a very interesting part of what you mentioned. So can you explain the importance of doing things that are meaningful to your healing? Yes, you just brought right. this up, but I thought it was a great part of your book. So people have to find their own path to healing. It has to be personalized, but that doesn't mean it's you know infinite. There are certain ways to do that. And what I've tried to do in my own practice and what I tried to describe in the book is that you can actually be begin to get people on their own path by finding out what matters to them, okay? So if you start with a question, and I do this in, in my practice first, I find out what matters to them, what's meaningful and important to them in their practice. And then what are they already doing to try to enhance their ability to do that, to maintain their health and their function, to do what's important, most important with them. And then we build on that. That starts them on the path and, uh, of their healing journey. And I bring the evidence in, okay? I bring the science in, I bring the medical part in uh, to support them in that process. And once they start on that, then they're empowered. Then they're actually able to begin the recovery process. And it almost doesn't really matter where they start. Some people like to start with nutrition because they love nutrition. Some say, I want to start with some kind of spiritual practice, meditation, for example, or yoga or something like that. Uh, some are enamored by exercise. Uh, for some, it's about social support. And for some, it's about actually giving back to society, their own spiritual journey, if you will. And so we start there. We bring the evidence in, we support them in that process. And when they become good at that, then they'll start doing the other stuff too. Uh, so you don't have to do everything at once. You just have to do one or two things that are important and meaningful for you uh, and be successful at it. I love that because being in the wellness community now, I am sort of overrun with information about all of the different self-care practices I should be doing. And you know, I still have a bit of thyroid dysfunction, so this sort of food and that sort of supplement, it, it can be very overwhelming. Yeah. And so when I saw in your book, the idea of what do I actually enjoy doing for self-care or what's meaningful to me as far as, you know, eating certain foods or what makes me feel good or feel bad, that mm -hmm. sort of helps right away to prioritize those things at the top of where you would start. Or if you only have so much time in a day to take care of yourself, those are the things you would That's right. focus on. You don't have to eat the whole smorgasbord, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's all there, but you know, you're not going to eat everything on the, on the entire array of what's available. Uh, you have to start with what you like and what is important to you. And then the role of the healthcare system is to actually bring what evidence do we do have about it, imperfect as it might be, in to say, this is gonna likely help, okay? Now let's try it out, okay? Now let's work with you to see if it's gonna help you. And that's where, you know, going in and assessing, is it working? And you can assess it, you know, using standard approaches of asking the person and doing questionnaires, or in some cases, you can actually do biochemical tests and see, is it actually helping with their cholesterol, their weight, their diabetes, you know, the things that they're trying to improve. Uh, and then measure that in the individual. If it's not working, then adjust in those areas. And that's where this complexity science comes in and informs uh, the practice and, you know, which part of the banquet to eat from. Also in your book, you mentioned something called the Society for Interdisciplinary Placebo Science. Yes. Started about four years ago and uh, to study the placebo effect, or yeah. what did you say we should now call it? The meaningful? The meaning effect. The meaning, the meaning effect. response. The meaning response. I, I like that the better anyway. Response. So have there been any discoveries or recommendations that have come out of that society in the last four years? Yes, we, we were one of, the, one of the groups that helped to support and get this uh, society going. I'll give you one example. We used to think that uh, the placebo was just due to expectation. If you believed it, it was a belief and that was gonna happen. And so you had had to uh, sort of blind people if they weren't getting an active treatment, if you were giving them a placebo. They couldn't know, right? Because that would then interfere with their belief and then that would interfere with the placebo effect. We now know that's completely wrong, okay? Uh, there's been extensive studies now using open placebo. And what they do is they tell the patient, I'm gonna give you an inert substance, but if you go through this healing ritual, if you work with me on this and you engage in the therapy, uh, the evidence shows you're gonna get better. And you know what? They do. 
<laughs> it so actually right. is just as good to do open placebo as blind placebo. You don't have to be unethical and tell them you're you're not you're giving something when you're not. You can say, "This is what I'm doing. Let's go on this healing journey together, and let's go through it, and you'll get better." Because a lot of what happens is unconscious. A lot is actually social and emotional changes. The belief of the provider, the practitioner, the culture that you live in, and so if you can arrange that to create an optimal healing environment, then they can also stimulate the person's healing. And it's not so much what you're thinking up in your head that does have some influence, but not nearly as much as we thought. So that's a discovery that's come out of that kind of research now. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten more and more interested in the subconscious or unconscious component of living and healing anything. Um, and that sounds like right up with everything else I've heard about how important that that is. Your mindset has a huge impact. And uh, if you think you're on a healthy diet, but you know you don't like it and you actually don't believe it's very healthy, that's gonna have as much influence as what's in the food. And, and that's been actually shown quite extensively. Aliyah Crum is a researcher at Stanford who runs the Center for the Mindset. And she looks at how do you change the mindset around things like drugs, food, exercise, even stress. If you pursue Perceive stress as something you're going to get strengthened by, as opposed to something that's going to beat you down. The same stresses actually will help strengthen you, oh my gosh. Uh, as opposed to interfere with your ability to function. So the mindset is crucial. So I should start thinking of my inbox as something that's going to strengthen me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if that's the thing that you're now perceive as, as weakening you, then yes. changing the mindset around that would probably be yes. helpful. I yes. liken it to just a faucet. It never <laughs> stops. Like every right. time I think I'm making well, my way through. You know, it's important. Uh, you know, the whole issue of the onslaught of information is not something that humans have been used to. You know, we're used to sitting around and talking and laughing and sharing meals and spending time, you know, engaging in love, right? And, you know, when we get embedded and indented with information, it interferes with that process. And that's been well demonstrated now. So you got to manage it right. You know, you yeah. got to give yourself a break on those things and get back to those core human things, uh, which facilitate health and well-being. In your book, you mentioned a statistic, which is that interventions like surgery and medication produce unwanted side effects in more patients than benefited from them for chronic health conditions, yeah. um, often 50 to 60% of patients. So that's more than half. Why is that sort of still the first tool being used in the conventional system yeah, today? I think unfortunately that's true, is that many interventions actually harm more people than they help. And I think part of the reason is that we have a payment system that will pay for things that can be proven to help a certain number of patients. And then you're able to market it, you can get it approved, you can sell it, and you can make a lot of money off of it. And so, uh, you know, that's what's pushed and that's what doctors have and that's what they deliver in those areas. So an example is back pain. Uh, surgery is uh, over $40 billion is done on surgery for back pain. And yet the vast majority of people, 80 to 85%, don't have something that surgery is gonna benefit. Uh, so we looked at how much of the benefit that people get from surgery is actually due to the surgical procedure or simply the ritual of care going through, uh, you know, actually just getting care uh, by people that are taking care of you. So we looked at all the studies in which they had compared surgery with sham surgery. So they went through the whole ritual, the placebo surgery components, and then uh, followed them for up to six months later in their back pain and showed that there was no difference. All of them uh, improved at about the same rate in both groups. Uh, and yet there were more side effects in those that got the actual surgery. So that's an example of uh, having something that actually hurts people more than it helps them. And yet there's a huge industry doing back surgery. And so the economics drives it rather than the evidence. People at home watching this as part of the Wellbe community are now thinking, how can I utilize this incredible meaning response or placebo effect which has now been studied by somebody who's, you know, obviously so revered. Um, how can I utilize this in my own life before I actually need to be in the healthcare system? So at the end of the book, I try to show both how you can do this with your doctor and how you can do it on your own. Uh, 
uh, and have provided some simple steps that you can go through to actually enhance your own inherent healing capacity and what those steps are. There's a series of questionnaires and things that you can implement. So I'd look at the last chapter. On my website, uh, I've also built on that. Uh, we've provided a number of tools. So for example, I use the term integrative health to describe this new model of whole person care. And you can actually ask your doctor to do an integrative health visit. And I have tools that show how to do that. It's things called the personal health inventory and the hope note. Uh, very easy to do. I teach residents to do it. I teach providers all around the country how to do it. So number one, ask your doctor how to do it. Uh, if you can't find somebody to do it, then look at the components of it and begin to embed that in your own life. So there's a questionnaire on self-care that you can begin to apply, how to put your own team together, which areas to address, how to identify what's going to be most relevant and meaningful for you. Engage in those types of things until you find a healthcare provider, maybe it's a doctor, maybe it's a nurse, maybe it's a physician's assistant, that can actually do this jointly with you as part of your team. But remember, you're in the driver's seat. It's your health. It's your well-being. So make your own decisions about it and bring them in as part of the team members. Uh, but that doesn't mean do everything they say. I'm glad that you mentioned empowerment because at Wellbe, I say, you know, you are the CEO of your health and your body. At the end of the day, you're the only one who really needs it to work properly and do everything you want it to. So you're the expert. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You can allow people to partner with you, um, but, uh, you know, you've got to still see that you're uh, in the driver's seat. So there were three common aspects of healing that you also mentioned in the book. Mm -hmm. Can you talk just very briefly about what those well, are? Well, integrative health involves bringing together three different things. So conventional care, you've got to make sure you've got the right diagnosis and understand what health care provides, medical care provides. Uh, Non-pharmacological approaches, sometimes called complementary approaches and alternative approaches that are evidence-based, and self-care. Self-care or behaviors such as nutrition, stress management, exercise, etc. Finding a team that puts all three of those things together, that's the sweet spot. That's integrative health. The last thing I do with all experts and stories that I tell for Wellbe is ask something called the How I Get Wellbe series. So this is really just your can't miss wellness rituals and routines that you know if you do miss them, whether you're traveling home, have a busy day, whatever, you can feel that you might, you know, slip into a state of having a chronic health issue or just not feeling your best. Yes. So if you don't mind saying how I get well is. How I get well be involves four things. Number one, I get up in the morning and I say, am I doing something that I enjoy? This is something that's meaningful for me. Am I, am I contributing back in some way that's important to me? Uh, number two, uh, I make sure that my loved ones are somehow in the picture, my family, my friends, uh, my colleagues. What's my social support? Okay, how am I going to engage with them in some way? Uh, and I make sure that I do that every single day. Second, I pay attention to my body. Is my body being taken care of? Am I eating a healthy diet? I use a Mediterranean approach to the diet. Am I getting some kind of movement or exercise every day? Am I spending some downtime? You know, taking my phone away from myself, okay, in those areas, uh, engaging in some kind of uh, mindfulness-based or mind-body practice and relax. When I'm traveling, I try to exercise or I do some Tai Chi in the morning, for example, which helps me, gets me set. Uh, and the final one is I look at the physical environment that I'm in. Is it nurturing? Is it beautiful? Uh, do I get out into nature? Those are the four things I do every day to make sure I maintain my health and well-being. Wow, that sounds like a, a wonderful set of rituals. I, I feel like that would keep anybody well. So. I think it would. <laughs> yes, it's, it's great to hear. Um, thank you so much for sitting down with me. I know that everything that you've learned in your career and, and are a proponent of, as well as everything you've now learned about the meaning response or the placebo effect will be fascinating to my audience because I've really focused on so much of healing being related to what you eat and your gut health and these other components. But the more I learn, the more I realize um, the mind-body component is the most important of all. Well, thank you for having me and, uh, and thank you for everything you do to let people know about how to empower their own health and well-being.